Welcome to Educators for Anti-Racism, Science and Anti-Racism Session. My name is Leila Kabani. And my name is Dr. Keisha Savoy, and we will be your MCs today. Through these sessions, we will discuss key points from Dr. Bettina Love's book, We Want to Do More Than Survive, Abolitionist Teaching and the Pursuit of Educational Freedom. We will also discuss how we, as educators, can actively use anti-racist practices in our classrooms and our daily lives. A special thanks to our leading sponsor, Newton Schools Foundation, the Boston Community Foundation, the Brookline Community Foundation, the Greater Worcester Community Foundation, and you, our over 1,000 individual donors who helped make this conference possible. Today, we'll be using the hashtag Hashtag add anti racism. Educators for anti racism offer respect and gratitude to the sovereign tribal nations upon whose traditional homelands we reside. Indigenous people have not only been detached, displaced, and dispossessed from the ancestral homelands, but have survived countless waves of genocidal aggression from settler colonialism. We recognize that many individuals do not think about tribal nations in the present, but rather conceptualize them as if they are exhibitions in a museum. Indigenous nations are not academic footnotes. Indigenous nations exist now and will continue to exist into the future. A statement of land acknowledgement cannot be a token gesture or performative activism. A conscious acknowledgement that non-Native people reside on stolen land is the minimal action that must be made towards reconciliation, reparation, and rematriation. For those individuals who are not First Nation or Indigenous peoples, you have a responsibility to acknowledge the benefits you reap from settler colonialism. Take ample time to ask yourself, what privileges do I enjoy because of settler colonialism? How can I develop meaningful relationships with the people whose territory I'm residing in? What can I do beyond acknowledging? When you acknowledge traditional territory, is it formulaic or is it a transformative act that works to undo intentional erasure of indigenous people? In other words, is it just a box to check at the beginning of a meeting or is it a statement of commitment to engage in a meaningful action? In the chat box, we will share a link to the website Native Land. This website allows visitors to interact with maps of indigenous lands, treaties, and languages. Please open the link for use after this session. At this time, each participant will introduce themselves as well as recognize and acknowledge the traditional territory of where they reside. I will begin. I want to acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of Coast Salish and Duwamish. I want to acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of Shawnee land. And now I invite our speaker to introduce themselves and recognize the traditional territory of where they reside. Dr. Mensa. Good morning, everyone. I'm Felicia Mensa, and I recognize the territories of Muncie Lenape. I live in New Jersey, but I work in New York, and it's the same lands. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mensa. Now, we'd like to welcome all our attendees. An overwhelming number of educators answered the call this summer. We have teachers attending from all 50 states, from 24 countries, Welcome, educators. 
drop a line in the chat if you feel moved and tell us where you're from. Wow. Well, before we hand this off to our speakers, some rules of the road for all of us. Be mentally and physically present. Take notes, react in the chat, be here with us. Be open to new ideas and be reflective of how you can apply this information in your own life. Our goal is that you leave this session brimming with ideas of how to improve lessons using anti-racist principles. If you have questions, write them in the Q&A box. If you see a question you'd like answered, vote for that question by clicking on the thumbs up icon. The questions with the most votes will be brought up at the end of our Q&A session. The chat box is for comments, praise, thanks, all of the wonderful reactions. If you have a resource to share, please add it to the list. It's now being put in the chat box. We will disseminate that list after the conference. Finally, let's keep it civil. No racism, inciting violence or insults. Model empathy. True, very true. As anti-racist educators, it's our life's work to figure out how we can live out our values by building communities of care and accountability. Well, let's get this show on the road. Today, we are going to learn what it means to be a science and anti-racist educator. Dr. Felicia Moore Mensa is a professor of science education at Teachers College, Columbia University, New York City. Her research addresses issues of diversity, equity, and identity in science teacher preparation and teacher professional development with culturally relevant teaching, multiculturalism, and critical theories guiding her teaching and research. Her most recent research utilizes critical race theory and intersectionality to transform teacher education research and practices by looking at the experiences of teachers of color scientists of color and preparing future teacher educators for racial literacy. It is with great honor we present Dr. Mensa. The floor is yours. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited. First of all, thank you all for the invitation to be with you this morning. Thank you. Um, I'm just so full and just so happy to be with you all this morning. So I have a whole lot to share with you. So much to share. I had a difficult time trying to trying to figure out what to share and what to take out of my presentation. But what I share with you, I hope it's very informative for you and your practice and also to give you a chance to learn a little bit more about what I do as a science teacher educator. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. There. And there. And there. So you all can see my presentation, I hope. Okay, very good. So I want to start off with uh, a little bit of just about myself because it's gonna give you a little bit more of a context of why I come to this particular work. And I'm gonna go ahead and start. But, oh, before I start actually, I want you all to do this. I want you to put into the chat box a positive thought that you want to share with your attendees this morning, just to evoke that positive energy. And if you all get my uh, quote here as a joke, um, please uh, respond positively and not negatively. So I'm just going to give you a moment to go ahead and do that. See, as science people do have a sense of humor, right? Thank you. Thank you all for all that activity that's going on in the chat box. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the presentation because as I said before, I have so much to share with you this morning. So I, I wanted to start off telling you a little bit about me. And uh, I grew up in rural North Carolina, <laughs> and uh, I'm the eldest daughter, and I take that position very seriously as being the eldest daughter, but it gave me a chance to do things first, 
But growing up in rural North Carolina, I felt like the country was my science laboratory. So I had many opportunities to run around and to just kind of take up in nature. And so science had always been with me. And as you look at my biography going across, I highlight all the ways or all the different ways that I came into being science as a science teacher, as a science major. I worked as a scientist in Procter and Gamble for a little while. I also worked in a hospital. And when I went to Tallahassee, to Florida State University to get my degree in science teacher education, it, it, it gave me a different way to look at my work and the work that I was doing even as a scientist. And it actually has um, propelled me to think about it much more deeply, which is why I think it's really important to be able to see um, how this change of practice is also involved in how I change and look at science very differently from my experiences. So I've been in teacher's college since 2004 as a science teacher educator, and I love the role that I'm doing there and the kind of work that I'm doing as a teacher. But I just want to share with you this biography because it's going to come through at different moments within the presentation and why it's really important for me to think about my work uh, in, a, in a different light as I take on all these different experiences of what I've gone through as a scientist, as a science teacher educator. So I just want to also thank Dr. Love for her book. Uh, it's given me a new lens on the ways that I look at my work and the way that I think about uh, what my biography has meant for me and what I do also as a science teacher educator. But these are just two quotes I want to start with, and I'm going to represent her words throughout the entire presentation. But first of all, this idea around freedom was really important to me for me to think about, and it made me think about the culture of science. And so this whole idea of wanting to be, wanting to have the, well, having this struggle around what it means to be able to think differently about the culture of science. And so those who are scientists or in, you know, in the field of science can really relate and understand that there is this culture that we do have to overcome. And I find that this is the struggle for trying to do the work that I'm doing. I also love the ideas that she had in the book around mattering and, and this quote in particular, but for dark people, you know, such as I, the very basic idea of mattering is sometimes hard to conceptualize when your country finds you disposable. And so to me, that related a whole lot about who can do science. And so as I go through this first part of my presentation, it really is a, a way for me to take on and the language and, and kind of invoke the spirit that Dr. Love had within the book for me to think about science and and my experience is going through it. The second part of my presentation, we're gonna have a break, and then the second part of my presentation is my rethinking about the impact of what her work has had and for me to reconceptualize you know, a lot of what I've been able to do within my work and get in, in the book giving me a new language to talk about my work. So, so I divide this presentation up into thinking about why do we need anti-racist and abolitionist science teacher, and I'm going to go through this in four different ways. First, the data and the research tells us that we need anti-racist and abolitionist science teaching. The pedagogy is going to tell us that we need it. The curriculum that we teach in our science classrooms or even in science teacher education is also going to tell us. And finally, the children are going to tell us why we need anti-racist and abolitionist science teaching. So the first part of this I'm going to go through to talk about why we need this, but the second part is going to be what does it look like when we turn and take on anti-racist and abolitionist science teaching. So here's the need. This is one of the reasons, and this is the data that, she, that, that I'm sharing with you. So if you look at this graph that's in front of you on your screen, you can see that Black and African American um, people, um, in, in terms of the great degrees that they're um, um, getting, that we, uh, there, that's a slither of it that you see, right, in comparison to um, the greater population. But you can actually see, I'm gonna move this so I can see my screen better, but you can see that, um, that um, black people and Hispanic or Latino people, American Indian, you know, Alaska natives, you know, all of them in terms of looking at the greater part of the graph is that we, um, our percentage of representation for ethnic and racial groups is much smaller. The disparities for those getting associate degrees, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and doctoral degrees. And so within this, this is really the information that talks about science and engineering degrees. And so there are not that many in comparison relatively. So for me, this tells me there is a need to start to think about anti-racist abolitionist science teaching from the data. So I have another graph to share with you. 
this one also speaks to the amount of time that we have in school. So a lot of the work that I do is with elementary science education, even though I was a former high school science teacher. But if you look at this graph as well, primary grades in terms of science is very little. You know, it's almost um, shameful to think about the amount of science that is not happening at the elementary school level. So on average, 15 to 17 minutes of science compared to reading and language arts and mathematics. And so this tells you that science at the elementary level is not a high priority subject area. And so this is another reason why I feel like we need to have anti-racist and abolitionist science teaching. As we continue on, this is, a, this is something that I've had my students to do as part of their first assignments in the elementary science methods class. And I've had my secondary students do this as well. But they create a science timeline and they make drawings and things of that sort of their experiences in science uh, from K-12 through college. And these are just some of the words um, that come out of what they talk about their experiences in science. Very low scores that they had, this idea of dropping out of chemistry or other high level science courses. Um, this student says that her passion was stifled. She hated it. Uh, you find that the science being taught was unrelatable and uninteresting deconceptualized education. If you look at the second quote, what this person says, I took only one science course in college and she found this class to be very boring, so boring, and then was dozing off. And if you look at the third person, she says she dreaded it and that she did not understand the class of the content and the, in the lab rhetoric section that she took, you know, she found it to be confusing. And so if students are going through science classes and science laboratory experiences with this, we definitely need to think about an anti-racist abolition science teaching um, program. And so the children tells us, I spend lots of time, as I said before, with elementary schools. My background is, is, is high school science teaching, but I've also worked in middle schools and worked with teachers and professional development. And so I just want to show you a little bit of a graphic of what this looks like as well. So here we have children run, you know, into the elementary classroom. They're so excited about learning science. I love going to elementary classrooms. Students run up to you and like, what are we going to do today? They're so full of excitement. But when they get to middle school, uh, they just kind of show up. They're there, you know, the expressions of excitement are no longer there for them. And then we get to high school, unfortunately, slowly going into the classroom. There's just, you know, like they're angry coming to the science classroom. They're crying coming into the science classroom. But then as I've been reading and thinking about the work, not only of Dr. Love, but also Goldie Muhammad, where, you know, we first start off in elementary schools where children have this joy in of science, so this, black, this black joy, this brilliance, this genius comes out when they're in the elementary schools. But over time, eventually gets to the point where school and science learning is like spirit murdering. You know, we, we, they've lost their joy, they've lost their fun and their engagement for science. And so to be able to think about what do they need that can excite that joy that they had from elementary school and have it to continue all the way through middle, high school, and also into college. So for me, again, this is, the, this is why we need to have anti-racist and abolitionist science teaching. So I'm going, I want to have you all engage in a short little test with me. So if you have paper nearby, or you can type it out if you have on um, you know, your computers. But I just want to give you a short little test as we're going to go through the next part of my presentation. I'm going to show with you um, different terminology that you are probably familiar with, but I want you to think about it slightly differently in the context of science, and in the context of science education. Uh, and I'm going to talk this through with you, but it's also part of the experiences that I had as a science person or as a science major. It's also experiences I have working with teachers um, in their classrooms and also working with pre-service teachers in my uh, elementary science methods classes. So I just want you to get ready for it, but I'm sure these terms, you've, you know them, you've seen them before, but they're going to look a little differently as we think about them in the context of science. So here we are, we have the science teacher. And these are things that, that I have heard teachers say, and these are things that have been said to me even from my science professors when I was in college. So we have, you know, you want to, this idea of getting to know your students, um, but what does this mean? These students can't do this work, I feel sorry for her. Give everyone the same thing. 
you should try harder or study more. I don't see color. I treat all my students the same. So if you are familiar with some of these quotes that you may have even said yourself or you've heard other people to say, you know, what happens when we put words and language to it? And that's one of the things that I talk with my pre-service teachers and in-service teachers, like what is the language and how do you put words to these different things? And so for, for this one, this idea of superficiality, meritocracy, deficit conceptions and inferiority, colorblindness, and equality. So I'm going to go through these all in detail, but again, I want you to think about it in the context of what science is and science teaching and learning. So when we say, or we hear teachers say, you know, getting to know your students, and I hear this often, but I think what we wanted to do is to say, we have to go a little bit more deeper than that. So even in the book, Dr. Love talks about having a home place and having children matter. And so me, this means going a little bit more deeper under the surface. You all know about the iceberg kind of an analogy. Like, how do you go deeper? How do you go below the surface to really get to know your students at that particular level? So spending time with them, getting to know who your students are. And we rarely ask them, well, what are your experiences with science? What are your experiences learning science? And we lose a lot of that information when we don't know, that we cannot incorporate that into our science teaching when we don't know what students' experiences are. So we have to be able to see students' talents and look at achievement and success in new ways. Like, what do they bring into the science classroom that you can incorporate as part of your learning? And also, do you, and also, do you allow students to express themselves in very different ways? And so a reflective question for you to think about this idea of superficiality and getting to know your students is like, do you have multiple in varying ways that you want to get to know your students and for them to get to know each other. So in a science classroom, you're often uh, fixated on the content, but how do you relate the content back to students' experiences? And so when I was growing up, my teachers never asked me about the experiences that I had running through cornfields and what did I know about growing corn or what was it about the different kinds of flowers and plants that were in my backyard that I could make those types of connections. So had they asked me and made those particular kinds of connections for me, I'm sure science would have had a lot more meaning for, for me. So now when we think about meritocracy, no, you should try harder or study more. So I had my organic chemistry professor to tell me this when I went by for office hours to ask him about some problems in the class that we were working on that I did not understand. So imagine students coming to you for assistance and then you tell them, you know, you should work harder, you should study more when I already was or students already feel that they are. So this lets me know that students are rewarded based solely on their ability does not, um, does not equate to being the best and the brightest. And often in science, this is what we're looking for the best and the brightest and we neglect to observe students that have uh, interest in science and then we just don't pick them or choose them to be able to uh, be science lab um, um, I'm sorry to be science to be able to be involved in science a little bit more deeply because we're looking for the students that are only making all the A's or the top grades but we have to start to look at individual individual achievement uh, you know you look at it through this idea of meritocracy that it's the independent variable and this is a, and you start to develop an unhealthy competition among students in the classroom. So, but we know that there are systemic and institutional barriers that hinder academic success. And so we have to be able to think about that as students are going through their science teaching and uh, going through their science education, because there is, because, the, because many of them have to contend with not only trying to understand science and the culture of science, but they have to also compete against uh, having low resources for being able to learn science. And so not all students have the same opportunities for success in your classroom. So a question you wanna be able to ask yourself related to this is who becomes the resources manager? You know, is that that student is always making the A's in your classroom? Um, what about who gets chosen as a lab assistant to help you in the classroom or to be a teaching assistant? So is your class um, or course a weed out course? So do you have students who if they fail the first test or the first couple of tests and you are used to, you put into your mind that they cannot do science. So we really have to rethink this, these ideas around meritocracy and really understanding what this culture of science looks like and how it is um, marginalizing a lot of students. The third one, uh, deficit 
misconceptions and inferiority. So these students can't do this. And this is related to uh, what I mentioned on the slide previously. But with this one, you really have to hold high expectations for your students and they will meet it. But you also have to help them to meet it and give them the sort supports to be able to do that. So this idea of being able to build on the knowledge and experiences that students have and they bring into the science classroom. But we also want to be able to invite and engage students in the classroom so that their full assets, their full strengths are on display in the classroom. And so Dr. Love talks about this idea of thriving. She wants us to thrive and not survive. And so even in the science classroom, are your students thriving? or they're just trying to get through your get through your course to go on to something else. And so we have to be able to see that being able to thrive is the option. It is the only option that we have for our students in their learning. And so do you assist all your students to be successful in the classroom? What are those oppressive structures and barriers that are hindering students from being able to advance in science? And so for me too, I've been thinking a little bit differently about what successfulness looks like in the science classroom. It can look very different from students. It can look very different from the way that I thought about success when I was going through science. And so being able to say, what does that look like for the individual student so that they can help to define their own success and not feel like they have to be in competition with others. Um, and so really trying to think about, you know, embedded within these ideas are these, these ideas of deficit conceptions and inferiority in learning science. And so the next one. Um, you, I'm going to show you a cartoon. You probably have seen this cartoon before, and but again, I want you to think about it in the context of science learning. And so here we have equality and equity. Again, I'm sure you've been very familiar with this cartoon. And so we see the three people standing there trying to watch the game, and I'm, I'm imagine this is trying to involve themselves in science. And so the first one, like, equality is giving everyone the same thing. So everyone has the same stand that they're standing on. But we know equity is giving them what they need. And so we see that the third person, the, you know, the short person with the purple shirt on has to have two scaffolds. And so what goes on with this particular uh, cartoon is that this is the reality of it. Those who have get more and those who have less resources are taken away from them. So when I looked at this cartoon again through the lens of the way that Dr. Love talks about it, she says this idea of liberation. So the ultimate, ultimate goal of our abolitionist teaching is this idea of freedom, is liberation, is to disrupt to dismantle, to destroy, and to abolish. So how do you tear down that fence? And for me, it's like, how do I tear down the culture of science so that students have more of a freedom and liberation to learn science and to be active and engaged in science learning? So how did you do on your test? <laughs> you know, again, I can't have the interaction to hear your voices, but you can definitely use a chat feature and talk a little bit about, you know, what are those, what were your test results as I went through those five different um, concepts related to science learning. I'm actually gonna pause here so that I can see if there are some connections that people are making between what I just said um, in this first part of the presentation. So perhaps some of my, um, facilitators can read out some of these comments that have come through the chat box and how people are making connections. And perhaps I will. <laughs> I, I see someone says that the images are removing the fence. Um, there are a couple of resources in there, defense being structural racism. Yes, Stephanie, thank you for that. Sorry, Dr. Mensa. Our, we now have the ability to speak and show ourselves. I'm happy okay. to and share uh, some of the great comments that have been um, written. One of my favorites so far comes from Helen. I have students write a science autobiography where they describe a time that they have learned science, can be positive or not, in a relationship that has influenced their learning in the first weeks of class. This helps me get to know their story and sometimes the joy or trauma that they carry around their experiences in science education. Brilliant, I love that. Oh yes, yes, and I notice that too when I have the students do their biographies, yes. 
So now I'm coming back to where I started in terms of my outline. The data the research tells us, or told us, I share with you, as well as the children, the pedagogy and the curriculum, had told us that there is a need for anti-racist, abolitionist science teaching. Now, what does that really mean? And what does it look like when we actually do engage in anti-racist, abolitionist science teaching? So imagine, as Dr. Love says, we have to dismantle and abolish. So what happens if we did that in science education? We tore it down, you know, the fix is gone. <laughs> so now we have an opportunity to have a much more colorful way to look at science and look at science education. We can rebuild this wall, so to speak, in various, in various shapes and sizes to accommodate the students that we have, to also accommodate the kind of content that we want to share in our classrooms. And so for me, this is the work that I do on a consistent basis as a science teacher educator, as I dismantle and think about science in a very different way. And so um, this is what I'm gonna share with you in the second part of the presentation, and also the part of the book that I so much love about um, the Dr. Love shared, I will still uh, evoke some of her voice throughout the presentation. So here we have again. Um, when I think about this particular quote, when she talks about what abolitionist science, what abolitionist teaching is, you know, again, I want to think about it from the from the wrong context of science. So abolitionist teaching is built on the creativity, imagination boldness, ingenuity, and rebellious spirit and methods of abolitionists to demand and fight for an education system where all science students are thriving and not simply surviving. And for me, this is a redefinition of what is science and how science is defined. Her second quote that also touched me was, when teachers shy away from intersectionality, they shy away from ever fully knowing their students' humanity and the richness of our, their identities. And again, to me, this is the part that I feel like we're missing so much in science education, this idea of intersectionality. And I talk about it in my research as positionality. It's like the identities, not only of our students, but also ourselves as science, as science educators. So she talks a lot, you know, in the book throughout this idea of being able to matter. So mattering cannot happen if identities are isolated and students cannot be their full selves, that they cannot show up in your science class as their full selves. And then to me, this relates to the idea of who is a scientist and how do we define who a scientist is. So after I've had a chance to tear down the walls and then rebuild them in a very different way, this is what I'm going to share with you in the next few slides of how I do this and take on this idea of anti-racist and abolitionist science teaching. So this is a partial quote um, that I've taken uh, from uh, a piece that I've had, had um, published, but it's also something that I used to do on the first day of class. And so I'm just gonna read a little bit of this little um, uh, memoir of sorts that I, that I have with you. It's the first day of class. They entered the science methods course thinking that it would consist of science lectures by the professor where they expect to learn the facts of science. Hello class, I think it's time to get started. Welcome to MSTC 4040. Many comment, you are my first African-American science teacher. And for others, you're my first African-American teacher. So when I first came to Teachers College, I had this opportunity to come in and kind of get a sense of what students thought because I knew that I was not your typical looking science, uh, science person. And I would go to class early and sit among the students as though I was a student. And I would just sit and I would you know, look and observe and I would tell people like, hi, hi, how are you? And, you know, as people kind of flick, kind of trickle in and come into the classroom and you know, they're looking around, they're wondering like, who's the science professor? Like when, you know, when is he coming and all of this? And then I do, I stand up, I say, well, hi, class, let's go ahead and get started. And you cannot imagine the big eyes and the big surprises when I stand up and say, I'm your science professor. And so um, throughout the times that I've been teaching, I would give a survey and I ask students, you know, how many other um, science teachers of color have you had or black teachers have you had? And they say that I'm their first one for, as a science teacher or as a teacher period. And so I imagine like you've gone through your entire um, 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 experiences as, as learners and you're in a graduate program and you've never had the, the opportunity to learn from a person of color or an African-American science 
teacher, you know, it, it just kind of baffles me in a lot of ways, but it goes to the data that I mentioned earlier part of the presentation. And so to me, this is where I feel like you have to be, you have to address this anti-racism within science teacher and within science education, that they get to the point where they've never had a science professor or female science professor or a female black science professor. So this is what I'm, this is what I do in terms of thinking about how to make those connections for students. And so the other part that I feel is part of the data is this, uh, this whole idea of like, what is science and where do we find science? And so for me, science is everywhere. You know, it's there in front of us. So I share this picture as well with students to be able to make these connections that science is truly everywhere. So this is a picture that I took when I was on vacation with my sister several years ago when we went to Jamaica. And um, I love this tree because the natives were telling me they call it the dreadlock tree. And, and then it was in a rainforest. And so it, it, it allows me to share this picture with students in the class and then to ask them, like, you know, what's the science behind this? Like, what do you notice about it? And they tell me, and I'm asking questions about it. But then I get to the point and say, you know, this tree actually looks like me, or this tree can look like students that you have in your classroom. And I talk about the roots being above ground, but the roots look like dreadlock. This looks like the hair. And I tell them, and I tell them, imagine if you presented this picture to students in your class, black and brown children, and told them, you know, there are things in nature that look like you and just kind of like, like what it looks like me and just try to give this idea about how science could be connected to them in a very real way but at the same time I want them to know that science is everywhere and that we have to make those connections to students and so the very first assignment that they have in the class is that they have to go out and take pictures of science in the city you know around or they can take pictures out of their own personal um a photo um, albums and things of that sort, but they have to come back to class and be able to make the connection back to science. If they can't make the connections personally to themselves, how would they be able to make those connections to students? How are they gonna make those connections to students and their experiences with science and their own in their own lives? And so that's the first assignment that they do within the class. I come back and there I get really great pictures and connections that students are making. Uh, and so I'm gonna share some of those with you. So here we have a student who brought in popcorn. Um, you know, she talked. Like, she talked to you know how popcorn was a really um, um, one of the favorite snacks that she has. Also, one of my favorite snacks. But to be able to see the, the the popcorn in the different stages and being able to make connections back to this, you know, the possible connections to science around matter. You know, the color, the texture, the size, and the shape. All these different skills can be presented out of looking at popcorn in a very different way. And what happens when you heat up substances in your kitchen, you know, pop, pop and popcorn. This other picture that the person sent to me was, um, uh, it was actually a clip that she did show in class, but it was um, some street artists um, playing music and singing. And she made connections to energy, vibrations, how sound travels, and human interaction with matter and energy. And so, this is another way to say that science is there. How do you make those real relevant connections to the science to be able to have a little bit more of a deeper understanding? So let me share two more examples. So here um, is a picture of a plant growing out of the cracks of the sidewalk. And to me, you know, the kind of like this idea of resiliency that nature naturally has with this plant being able to grow out. So looking at the parts of a plant, the life cycle of a plant. Um, you know, I had very beautiful pictures of even plants growing on the side of the walls of buildings and things of that sort. And then here's one about the bridge. So this one is also important to me because um, I don't drive into campus often, but you know, I do take the George Washington Bridge. And so here's a picture where she talks about possible connections to forces like gravity, tension, compression, suspension in terms of the structure of the bridge. And then just how people design um, bridges to balance off different kinds of forces. It's also connected to transportation, you know, coming in and out of the city. And so it's really important to be able to think about how do you have these different connections to science, personal connections to you that you can you, that you can use um, the science concepts for, for to become more alive for, for students in the science classroom. And so here are two additional quotes as well that, that I um, want to share from Dr. Love's book, when she talks about 
you know, teachers of all backgrounds walk into science classrooms, never studying the history or the culture of the children that they are going to teach. And as I said before, you know, students have their own identities, their intersectional identities that we don't think about and that we don't make those connections in the classroom. Another facet, Dr. Love says, uh, and I'm taking it to be as a science teacher, is that we have this gap in white students' limited interactions with people of color, which perpetuates the myths about people of color. And so the schools that I have partnerships with are predominantly black and brown schools, and I want my pre-service teachers who are predominantly white pre-service teachers to know students and to know what their interactions with science and their ideas of science are. And so they have conversations with them. You know, I, I, I call it something, you know, the interview a child assignment that they have in the classroom. But really it's an opportunity for them to, to sit down with children, to talk with them about their particular interests, what about their science interests, and see if they can make some connections between the students' interests and backgrounds into the science curriculum. So the, ch the children can tell us, you know, and see how important it is to be able to make these connections um, to their culture and also to know what students, um, what they know about science. So one of the things we do in class is that they go back and they talk to students in science. They have to come back and figure out, you know, where are students' ideas coming from? And so there's a short activity that I'm gonna do with you again in the audience and you can put your responses in the chat. You don't have to respond to all of them, but, um, and this is another opportunity for me to get my facilitators ready to see what people say around what students are saying about their science um, connections. So here are four quotes. And I want you to think about what, this, what did these statements mean? You know, where do you think children got these ideas from? So just read them and, you know, maybe reply to one of them if you like, um, where you think students' ideas came from. So this is, these are actual excerpts that came from when I have done interviews with students myself. And these are some of the things that they've said to me in, in, in having my conversations with them. Chad's going really fast. Uh, I can't. Hey, some of them are from religion, likely from family or community members. Others show me that students have actually reasoned to the best of their ability given what they know. Yes. And then, sounds like the types of things my parents and grandparents told me when I was young to reassure me and help me feel safe during storms. Mm -hmm. And let's see what we have here. Yes. Okay. Shows an understanding that Earth's past is connected to Earth's present. Thank you. And so if you look at these comments that students have made, and, 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 and what was also shared by one of the facilitators, like students already have rich understandings of the world. They come into the classroom with their experiences, you know, three, four, five-year-olds have lots of experience, you know, relatively to their age, and they have already engaged with science. And when they come to our science classrooms, we cannot say that they, they do not know any science. They know, evidently. And so we also can see some cultural undertones from this. And I, and I love, number one, you know, just as one of the commentators said, um, you know, the connections that your parents would tell you about how they interact with the world and how they, um, you know, think about science and helping children to understand it. And so imagine again, if number one was a young child who goes to Sunday school, and this is something that their Sunday school teacher has told them, and they bring it to school, are you going to negate that they have this particular experiences when you're trying to teach about weather? You know, and I love number four as well, you know, so children also come in um, mimicking, you know, what they get from their parents. And this, and this young boy says, men mostly know how to use a map. So imagine that, you know, maybe traveling uh, from uh, one place to another on family trips and they realize their dad is looking at the map and things of that sort. So students are bringing all of that to the classroom. So then how do you use that? And how do you make those connections and also tell students that their ideas are valuable? So these connections of identity, these connections that students are making, they're very, very valuable as we learn and teach them in the science classroom. And so um, this, these are pictures of, of one of the little girl drew of me and her. So I'm the little person and she's the big person. But you know, when we go to classrooms and we're asking students like, what is science? What do you think science is? Do you think you're a scientist? And I ask children and I say, no, are you asking questions? And they say, yes. Are you doing mathematics in your class? 
using computers? Yes. Are we talking to other people in the classroom? Does, does the teacher let you, you know, talk to others? Are you solving problems? And they say, yes. Are you writing? Are you making observations of the world? And then I said, you have all these skills and you're a scientist. And so what we have to do is broaden this definition of what it means to be science, especially for young people. You know, they have this idea of, of science being uh, uh, Einstein and they're drawing those pictures and I've seen those pictures when I ask students to draw them. But we want to actually change that and, and have students to start to envision themselves as being the scientists. And because they're doing these, these particular practices and skills that scientists do. And so when I go to classrooms now and they've had an experience to talk about science and they're doing science their classrooms, you know, they're drawing themselves as the scientists. They're not drawing Einstein, and they're talking about what are they doing, what are those things that they're doing that makes them a scientist. So I love these pictures, and I love it when I'm able to ask teachers to have students to draw these pictures, and then they invite me in to talk to students, and so I can tell them again, using my own positionality, like, no, I don't look like Einstein, and it's funny, like, my hair is not wild and crazy, but some of you might look at it and say, it look a little wild, <laughs> you know, but, you know, not wearing the glasses and all of that kind of thing. And so you can get students to start thinking about themselves and involve themselves and, and calling themselves a scientist at the very young age. And, you know, and they're drawing these kinds of pictures. What also involves me that I see is like girls as well. You know, we trying to get the sense that only boys can do science. And oftentimes when I'm in classrooms and who has the materials, and this happens even in my graduate level class. If we're doing activities in class and I'm looking around and I can see like who, where the materials, who's, who's holding the materials, and it may be the boys. And I can, and I stop and tell them like, you know, can we all look around the class and see what's going on here? You know, do you notice? And have them to really notice that. So then when they're in their classrooms, are girls involved? Are they holding the materials? You know, are they are they only writing down notes? No, don't have you know, no writing down notes are good, <laughs> but have them you know involved in the activities and using the tools, having them to be able to think about you know uh, involving themselves a lot more in the science activities. And so then you start to see pictures that look like them. You know that the girls are the scientists, and even telling boys like no, boys are not the only ones that can be a scientist. Girls can be a scientist, and this and these are the things that girls can do. And so we have to be able to do that at a very early age because as they continue through school, you know, girls fall off because they have not had the opportunity to be involved and be as, as engaged in science learning as many times as our boys. So being able to do that. So then we start to get these pictures, as I said before, with the girls drawing themselves as a scientist. And so then this is just some of the pictures um, to let you all see the, the involvement and engagement that I have when I go to classrooms. And so when I mentioned before, and I showed you the data, you know, the limited time that we have for science in the classrooms. And so I'm working with my schools and my teachers that have more science time in the classroom so that students are engaged, can have lots of fun. We can see the smiling faces. We can see them using tools in, in the science classroom and that they are very much engaged and very excited about it. So I love these um, pictures of these active young faces engaged in science. So the culture. So I told you earlier, and you know, to me, the culture of science is the biggest part that we have to liberate, you know, because we think of science as being, you know, ob objective, there's no subjectivity within it, and that, you know, this culture of science can be very, you know, constraining, and it is very constraining. But as an anti-racist abolitionist science teacher, then we have to knock that down. And one of the ways that I do this and through the work that I do with teachers and, 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 in, and in my methods classes, you know, thinking about science and studying it through is what I call the socios and the socios, sociocultural, social historical, and social political context. These are the things that we're not doing to make those connections in science that can also make it much more relevant to students when they're learning about it, make it much more relevant to um, teachers when they're, when they're teaching it. And so the socios to me are embedded through and in the examples of the scientists and how they do their work. 
you know, embedded within this, within this context of values and experiences and visions and all of that, that also Dr. Love talks about in her book. So to me, it is embedded in the kinds of questions that, students, that scientists are asking and the approaches that they take when they're involved in, uh, and when they're doing science and solving different kinds of scientific problems. It's embedded in the lives and the histories of the scientists, which we don't get a whole lot of either. You know, how, their, how, is, how their work is being connected to science or STEM at large. You know, what do they call science? You know, how do they define what science is for them? You know, how does culture play its role and what part does it play in the experiences, the discoveries and different ways that we think about science or STEM? And then students. You know, so students need to be able to learn about the content, the knowledge and the skills and the practices that emerge out of science. And I think, again, this is where we start to rebuild science and it looks a lot differently than the canonical ways that we think about what science is often and I, you know, when we think about science. And so this is a lot of the work that I do as a science teacher educator to be able to think about this uh, very differently and to offer examples of what that looks like. So being able to study STEM in its, in its, and in its context, uh, I want to be able to add, um, oh, this is one more point. That, you know, as, as an abolitionist, anti-racist curriculum, I find it to also be interdisciplinary. So when you're able to make these connections you know, around the socios, it's, very, it's interdisciplinary science teaching. So I have a short clip that I want to show to you um, that gives this particular example. Um, I think I can show it. You know what, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna show it. I apologize, but you will have the presentation and you can watch this, but I, but I will tell you what, this, what it means generally. So um, this is um, actually a clip by Whitten Fitz where he talks about the history of where um, Amazing Grace comes from. And I play this in class as well for, for students to get an idea of what does this social, cultural, historical, and political context look like? Uh, and he talks about the history of the Black Negro spiritual. And so I, and he talks about what is the slave scale. If you have not seen this video, I, you know, when you get the presentation, uh, please look at it. And you know, just the first three and a half minutes of it or so, you know, will give you a lot of information, a lot of history around where that song comes from. And the connections that I have students to make in class is this idea of sound how sound travels and transportation. You know, this, their literacy connections which, which could, uh, connected to this because it's communication between slaves and how music and, um, became a very integral part of their lives. Uh, it could, could connect to social studies and ethnic studies with history, uh, slavery, slavery, faith, and beliefs. And also this idea around music. And so when I present this, you know, and maybe if you present, what to present this to students in a classroom, again, it's the interdisciplinary teaching that's present Present, but it's also the the um, the identity pieces that are connected to that. So I played music on um, growing up in schools. So I was actually uh, 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 I played the flute and piccolo um, from uh, middle school all the way through college. And so music is one of those things too that wasn't really involved with me when I was in teaching and when I, when I I'm sorry when I was in school as a, as a science student. So imagine if my teachers knew that and made those connections to science um, really relevant, relevant to me. And to think about that if you, you know, teach them with your students. Again, I touch on these ideas around um, religion and faith because that's really important to me. And the students who sing Amazing Grace in church, and now they kind of have a history behind where this music is coming from, but now you're connecting it to science as well, where they're able to learn about sound and transportation and all of that. So all these different connections, rich connections that can be made when we're teaching science. And so this, and even and sometimes I have teachers ask me about, you know, well, what about the science standards? You know, the science standards are secondary in many ways. I know we have the next generation science standards and all of that, but if you start to, um, you start from what students know and what their particular interests are, there's a standard that's going to touch it. And so flip that, you know, 
think about what it is that you want students to know and what their experiences are and then add the, the, the and then add the standard onto it what you often find when you're starting with students is that they're going to know a lot more than if you start with the standard and kind of develop your lesson plan from there but again you know, i think this is just a really a great example to think about the socials um that i'm that that i embed within my uh, within my practice to work with to work with teachers and then I have some more examples. Um, so then with this one, um, this is actually some work done by uh, one of my colleagues, um, Megan Bang and her colleagues. And this is a um, study that talks about um, uh, U.S. college students and indigenous Panamoni and Nagabi adults were looking at illustrations from children's books. And they were looking at the, you know, how coyotes and the badgers do their hunting. So the students were interpreting the relationship as competitive and the Nagabi adults viewed it as cooperative. Now, what happens when scientists come in? So this is the, the, the connection that to be able to make around the social cultural um, connections between learning science. So then what happens is that, so wildlife biologists initially hypothesized that the code coyotes um, and the um, badgers were hunting in the same area, they're actually competing for prey. But after further observation, they realized the badgers and coyotes were hunting cooperatively. And so this just tells you that in science, we really do have to think about the cultural orientations of what we're learning and what we're teaching. And they can produce very different interpretations of very different observations. And so prey and predator is actually taught you know a lot in the science classroom my content area was mainly biology but do imagine if you're as a biologist and you're talking about these different kinds of cultural contexts that it becomes different and you start to see science a lot differently as well so it changes the nature again what we said what is this cultural science so we start to involve these socios in, in the way that you're teaching and you're looking at the science and then um, another one. So uh, I, I laugh at um, George Washington Carver in, in the way in the times that when he's um, being uh, presented in school this awfully during Black History Month uh, that we they pull out your black scientists, but teach your black scientists all day long, you know, throughout the entire academic year. It does not have to always just be in the month of February. But I like his story because, um, you know, we know him for doing work with peanuts, but we don't know the rich work that he was able to do, the patents that he had, you know, the additional products that he was able to make out of the out of the peanut. But he also had discrimination to contend with as a, as a scientist and as a um, agriculturalist. Um, but he, but one of the things I liked about his particular story is that because because of the, the context he was in and because of the race and racism that was going on is that he actually had a mobile science lab that he would go from farm to farm to help scientists or help farmers to learn the science of what they were doing so they can grow better crops. And so uh, he, he, being able to think about that and the richness of his particular story within a science classroom, uh, within a science context that you're teaching, you're involving again those socios. Now the other thing that happens with science um, and learning during the month of March, you have Women's History Month, so now you're going to bring out all your women scientists, you know. So again, you can teach women scientists throughout the entire year. But Barbara McClintock, Madam C.J. Walker, and also the movie around Hidden Figures are wonderful examples to bring in those socios once again. I related a lot to Barbara McClintock when I was a science, science major because in her work uh, she talked about how she had to dress like a man and uh, and I've told this story to other people before when I was in the laboratory you know I'm a southern belle so to speak and so I wore dresses and pantyhose when I was working in the lab and I there was a chemical that fell on me but it didn't burn me but it burned a hole in my pantyhose and my classmates and the uh, lab instructor came over you know like you know thought something was wrong with me that I had burned myself and I, but I was perfectly fine and before I left class, the lab instructor said, well, you know, you really shouldn't be wearing pantyhose and, and um, you know, and, um, uh, to the laboratory, you know, to the lab. And so then I started wearing slacks, which I don't like to wear slacks. And so I was like, I can't be my authentic self in the science classroom. And so again, it's like, how do we, you know, how do we uh, know how does science put up these structures and barriers to us if we can't be our authentic selves in the science classroom? So her story resonated with me because she talks in her personal biographies, Barbara McClintock does, about how she had to dress like a man to be accepted, you know, how her, you know, that people didn't accept her ideas, but she changed the world of genetics. Uh, and so, um, again, 
being a, a, a woman, being able to do that, but she could not be her authentic self in the science room. And then we have these other stories of black women who could not be their authentic selves as well, or their knowledge was not ex accepted, or it took a while for people to come to the, uh, the, the brilliance that they had as science women. And so, a lot, you know, and so being able to share these stories about science and how it is set up in this particular structure that we really do have to abolish because we are, we're leaving out so much rich understandings and, and the rich uh, resources that are available when we don't open up the boundaries and broaden participation in science. So, and then again, these are some additional examples I just wanted to share with you. The, the Tuskegee experiments, I taught that uh, as a science teacher and also have presented that also with my students in my secondary methods classes at TC, studying the HeLa cells and the diabetes studies um, with the uh, Havasu Pupe Indians um, in type two diabetes. Very similar story to what happened with Henrietta Lacks that the, um, that the, um, community wanted to know more about type 2 diabetes, they gave their blood and their blood was actually used to test different kinds of things without their permissions. And so being able to t let students know um, 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 about these different kinds of stories and how we want to also to teach ethics when we're teaching science, um, letting people know about the discrimination, discriminatory practices that can happen when you're learning science. And again, this evokes and makes much more of a broader context of what science that is than saying we have your textbook and these are the facts and everything in the textbook is, is true. But giving students the opportunity to see the broadness and the richness of the socios that are embedded in learning and teaching science. And then here's another one. Again, it's like I really want to, to share with you all many examples because uh, we don't share this. And so here's another one where a lot of the master narratives that we have in science teaching come from the white male scientists. And so I've written about this with my colleague um, um, around science as white property. But now what, what would that mean if we had to think about science as also black property? So looking at the narratives of black women and their particular contributions, and I've given you some examples of what that looks like. Um, there, there are a couple of websites and I also have at the very end of the presentation that you will get when you see the full presentation, some resources that are available for you to go back and see some of these rich biographies that can be connected back to the science learning. And this becomes part of your curriculum. And so here, so if you have your phones in front of you, I want you to scan the um, code that is there and it's gonna bring up a document of these three questions. And this is gonna help guide us a little bit through our Q&A that we're gonna have just momentarily. And so I want you to have access to that. So somebody, it's gonna be these same questions that are here on the screen, but it be in front of you because I'm going to move off of this page. But I want some of these questions to be part of our Q&A and our engagement when we are, when, when I finish the presentation. And so, uh, but I'm going to give you again a couple more examples of what is, this looks like for each one of the questions. And I'm going to, I, I will go through this very quickly for the sake of time, but also to involve you just to give you a little bit of a hint of how I address these particular questions. And so the first one has to do with who is your syllabus. So one of my classes, uh, I had a group of students to do a presentation on a syllabus that was a primary part of one of their courses, plus one of the classes that I teach. And just quickly, I want you to look at the differences between these two syllabus, or syllabi, right? So here we go. Who do you notice? What do you see? Who do you notice and what do you see? So what I say by this is like, who is your syllabus? You no, know, it really has to do with who are you reading? What's the content of your particular course? You know, are you, do you involve um, scholars of color in your work? Um, you know, and then, even if you're thinking about the, um, the K-12 education, like, again, like, are you involving different voices of scientists in your classroom? So it really does matter who you're reading, what are you reading in the classroom if you really want to take on anti-racism and, 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 uh, and, um, and abolitionist teaching practices in the classroom. So your curriculum, you know, these are questions around what are you teaching? and who are you teaching? And so this is an example of a student. Um, so the second question that I asked on this was an example around who constructs the knowledge in your classroom. This was a response that a student sent to me uh, when he asked his first graders about a project they were doing in class. It was the first graders who want to invite the janitor to come to the classroom, knowing that there's 
knowledge, a wealth of knowledge, even in their own community, where they talked about, they were learning about recycling and they wanted to invite, involve the, the uh, and they wanted to invite, and they did invite the janitor to the class to interview him about the trash and everything that was going on within the school. They wrote letters to the principal advocating for um, having uh, recycling bins and things in their particular school. And so they actually did that. And they went through this process of, of seeing a need within their community from learning the science that they were doing, engaging in their science classroom, that they now involved a program, a recycling program in their entire school. So the students were able to go through this entire process as first graders, constructing their knowledge, guiding the, the, the direction of where they want to go in their learning. The second example, you know, and we ask about the identities of our students, but what about the identities as the teacher? How do you involve yourself within the science classroom? And so this is an example of one of my students who talks about how she was able to involve a book from her childhood that she taught in the classroom with the students. They were learning about animals in New York City, and she wanted to actually bring in something that was more related to her own identity growing up in Korea. And so she brought in this particular text for the students to uh, for the students to read and when she shared this with them they wanted to know a little bit more she said no it was written in Korean she read it to them in Korean and the students were just really really intrigued and excited about language and language use in the classroom and so this is another example like you know it's not very traditional right but it's very it's very much connected what the students want to know about that involved not only the teachers identities but she was able to expand and explore a little bit more deeply with students and their understanding of language in the science classroom. And then the final example I have here, um, this is an example uh, from children who, you know, we, I did this actually study across um, two, three, three semesters where we're involved in one of my schools around learning about um, green spaces and learning about air pollution within the school. And for this one, students wrote persuasive letters, so involving their literacy skills, where they wrote letters and suggestions. They drew pictures about why they wanted more green spaces in their neighborhood. They did a neighborhood walk, and they were realizing, you know, that they did not have a lot of green spaces. It also came from the year before where students were um, involved in, um, you no know, asking question about why are so many children absent from school because of asthma so we did an environmental study within the school um, within the school and within the school area and it came that students like well we need more green spaces in our neighborhood and they wrote letters unfortunately we did not get a response from the, from um, from the environmental uh, coordinations office but the fact is that the students voiced their their concerns and they wrote letters talking about what they needed in their in their in their community but it was also connected to literacy they were reading text and they were writing letters so as I wind down, you know, I really want to let you all know in terms of these examples, like, you know, we can use contemporary and diverse scientists, multicultural texts. We have personal stories that we can involve, you know, using different multiple perspectives, but really it matters what you select and how you use it. And this is really, I think, a foundational point of, of anti-racist and abolitionist teaching, that we have to build on cultural web, we have to build on the communities where our students are coming from, you know, we have to let children know that they matter in the classroom, uh, you know, we have to resist those oppressive structures and barriers that we have, and science has a lot of them, so, you know, contending with all of that, so we can rebuild you know, these walls that are multicultural, that are multilinguistic, you know, that are have various facets of what we look of how we look at science and I and, and to me that excites me about being a being a science educator you know it, it challenges me to be able to think about what this looks like additional examples that I might be able to involve you know and get into the point where science um is is much more fun and engagement to anybody who wants to um wants to involve themselves in it so I have this one clip that I do want to show with you. And it, to me, it is the example of what I've been able to do across my, my um, time at TC as I work with my pre-service and in-service teachers and how I make these changes to involve anti-racist abolitionist teaching and then what it looks like when students engage in this process themselves. So I'm gonna show you this clip. I think it's only like two minutes and then we'll have time for some Q&A. So hopefully you all can see this and hear.
Mm-hmm. Love that. <laughs> Love that. Anti-racist teaching is not just the, is not about acknowledging that racism exists, but about consciously committing to the struggle of fighting for racial justice. And it is fundamental to abolitionist teaching. This is not going to happen overnight. It's going to take some time. It's going to involve continuous learning. And there are so many resources that are available for teachers to be able to do this. And it has to be done because it has to be, <laughs> you know, it just has to be, it has to be for the children. And I tell my student, like, you, you have to know what, who your why is, know what is your why. And I do this work because it's for the children. I want them to be able to thrive and not just survive when they come to the science classroom. And so uh, another thing that I love about Dr. Love's book, which she talks about your freedom dreaming, so I'm going to leave you all with my freedom dreaming. And I've told students in the past, like, my dream is, like, if I were to walk into a science classroom and all the students look like me, and then I have them to write their science biographies, and they, and they tell me the rich, the rich opportunities that they had with learning science and loving science from K-12, every grade. And when they get to college, they've had black, they've had black teachers along the way. That's my freedom dream. So in the expressions of children and their engagement of science, that they grow up and they become science teachers and they become scientists. Uh, they, they're able to, um, to, to be in the classroom as science teachers. That they're a scientist and they're making new discoveries and, and finding new solutions to the, the, to the issues and the problems that we have in the world. You know, and that they're, are, they're, they're taking on the next generation of new minds and new ideas and they're making these really great connections to it all and so for me this is my freedom dream of why i think it's so important that we have anti-racist science teaching that we have abolitionist science teaching because you know the world depends on this <laughs> you know for children but just for the love and an engagement of science i you know and i showed you in my timeline from the time that i was born i feel like literally to this point now that science has always been an active part of my life uh, and i would love that for everybody who wants to go into science as a science major or not but just for people to have that really close deep connection to science just for their everyday life and everyday living so thank you all so much. I apologize for you know, if it was too, too much. <laughs> I was so excited. I'm like, but I want to engage now with you all in a Q and A. Okay. So first question that has come through: tips for getting students to know each other remotely. Oh, so yeah, I do this. I, I pose different questions about um, anything, like even that first question that I posed to you, to all of you, um, getting students to, an to answer things of that sort. Uh, I've asked students about, you know, what did you do that was science today? <laughs> and they, and they can talk about it. So there are many things that you can do. Um, you know, I've had students to create memes in class that has a, some kind of a connection to the content that we're doing. So lots of different things to do to, for students to get to know each other, but definitely around the science. I love the question, like, what did you do for science today? The next question comes from Victor Chen uh, from Redford, who is the chemistry teacher. And his question is, do you have suggestions for creating a culture of anti-racism in the classroom during the first weeks of school? During the first weeks of school? Yeah. Um, in some ways, um, I want to say not the first week of school. You know, sometimes I get this question about, um, you know, when to do it and when to do it. It's like, sometimes you, you have to, it depends on where you are within your continuum of learning. Um, some people can be very comfortable, you know, thinking about anti-racism and, 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 and abolitionist teaching and all, and all of that. You know, you have, you know, you talk about having to do the self work of yourself and being able to understand this. I cannot particularly say because I don't know who, who the students are. But that's the one of the first things, like you have to get to know who your students are. You know, what, what are their particular interests? How are you going to make these kinds of connections to um, what, what you uh, want students to know? But I feel like the examples that I offer to you can be some starting points to be able to do that. You know, as you look at your curriculum, as you look at who the students are in your classroom and how you can get to know them. You know, spend the first few weeks getting to know them and their experiences of what has happened with them over the past few uh, weeks around COVID, um, you know, and being able to be sensitive enough around that. So students may like traumatic. Um, and so just really getting a pulse on who are the students in front of you and, and getting to know them and having them get to know each other in those first weeks. 
Thank you. The next question comes from Michael Fagan. Um, we don't have your pronouns, so please give grace if we are, uh, if you're miscorrectly uh, stated. But the question that is asked, do you have suggestions for how to assess students' assets that they bring to the classroom and how to embed those assets into the curriculum you're teaching? Yes. So um, to me, this is a similar response to the question before. Um, being able to open up different forms of how you assess students to me is like, you know, what do they know? And so you probably have to think about assessment very differently than you thought about it before. Students want to share their knowledge, but it's not always going to be in the form of paper and pencil. You know, how diverse are those different kinds of assessments or opportunities that you have for students to be able to learn and the creativity around what students can produce for you beyond a paper and pencil kind of an assessment. Um, well, one of the activities that I did as a teacher and I, you know, do it with my pre-service teachers, it's like even writing the lab report differently. You know, what would your lab report look like if you wrote it to grandma? What would your lab report look like if you had to write it to, um, you know, a second grader? Now, what would your lab report look like if you wrote it to me as a scientist? So even this idea of different language that you're able to use, those are different forms of assessment off of the same activity that you might do in the classroom. So I, I think part of this, this, this question to me is like, how do you, you know, broaden, you know, that there's not this strict way that you're assessing each person in the same way? but really figuring out what is it that students know, what are the scaffolds that they need to be able to um, let you see and let them see that they do know the science. So it's kind of that for me, I think, it's just um, broadening the way and even your definition of what assessment looks like. Thank you very much. Keisha, do we have time for one more question? Please, and then after the conclusion of that answer, I'll go ahead and wrap us up. All right, thank you. This question comes from Deborah. Uh, she's from Philly physics and astronomy teacher. This is making me think deeply about at the high school level, how students are placed in advanced classes. I would love to hear your thoughts about whether using placement tests and metrics and requirements, having to take particular math courses, etc., is a racist practice. Could we discuss this a little? <clears throat> yeah, I guess I can show it, say in a very short, simple way that the, those tests are racist, <laughs> you know, and for you to figure out uh, for yourselves, you know, uh, different ways to assess students um, and opportunities to go into these higher level mathematics and science classes. Um, how, could, how else could you think about it? Um, you know, you, you know th almost in terms of a portfolio of the student and their assessment, um, you know, because tests do not, one test will not assess what students know and what their abilities are and so if you've had the student in classes and you're able to assess other kinds of qualities that will allow them to advance into these different kinds of classes and you want to be able to do that you know that is one of the that, that goes back to the idea that i mentioned around meritocracy like the best and the brightest only go of course we won't bright students and you know in and, and science but we forget about those students who are our b students or our b plus students or even our c minus students you know giving them opportunities and giving them the scaffolds that they need the supports that they need um to be able to advance in science um many of them have have lots of um interests but you know their grades may not show it so you have to be able to look at grades in a very different way uh, especially if students have an interest and a desire to want to go into the sciences well, thank you, Dr. Mensa. So this thank concludes, you. Yeah, this concludes the Q&A uh, portion of our session. A special thank you again uh, to our speaker and to all of the volunteers who were um, working behind the scenes, navigating the nearly 500 people we had on this call. Wonderful. And I just want to say to you know, Keisha and Layla and every all the interpreters and everybody, thank you all so much. And I apologize and I'm going to say that I'm apologize in a good way because I have so much to share <laughs> I have so much to share and I will take time and I'll go back and I'll look at the um the chat comments and the questions and everything because it's also going to help me to think a little bit more about my work so I thank everybody who was part of the the conference and putting it on you know I think I was the last speaker of the series and so there's still more to come but I'm just so thankful that you all invited me to come and share uh, a little bit of what I know and what I love to do. So thank you all so much for having me.
Cindy and thank you, Mensa, you've been getting a lot of love uh, in our chat. Um, thank you all for the love. <laughs> so much love. I would have loved to read the comment. I'll just read a couple. Uh, this has been another thing to help fill my cup and keep me refreshed and feeling restored. Excellent presentation, valuable information. Thank you for your dynamic presentation and many, many more, Dr. Mensa. So thank you very much. Um, we hope that you all are walking away with something you can take back to the classroom as we continue our journey towards becoming anti-racist educators. And please don't forget to visit the edantiracism.com website and contribute a resource. Thank you and have a wonderful day.